6.30, so we'll call this um, May meeting to order. Um, the focus of the meeting, uh, we're going to start with uh, a report from the auditor. Um, and then otherwise we have a, a EL a report to review, e EL 2.7. And otherwise, it's pretty much as usual. At the end of the meeting, we do have executive session time, and we will, as a board, uh, work on some public outreach work um, after the executive session. So seeing as we have no co uh, public for public comment, um, we do need to choose a meeting evaluator. If one of you would uh, volunteer to do that tonight, that'd be great. Perform in front of Paul. So I guess I'll do it. For well, no, I wasn't right. intentional. <laughs> Wait. Set up. Right? Yeah, I guess. All right, so, Teresa, you're on. Hey, uh, my name is uh, Teresa Kajensky. Yeah, uh, the June 30, 2018 um, audit of Orange Southwest School District. I believe you guys all have copies of the audit. Um, there is uh, a loose pieces of paper in there, that staple, I believe. This is called the governance letter. This is a letter from us to the board. Um, and there's just a couple things that I want to just point out in that. Um, that the first part just says that we, our responsibility is to audit the financial statements um, in, in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and government accounting standards. Um, we also perform something called a single audit, which is um, because you, the district receives $750,000 of federal funding. It's a, it's a compliance audit of major funds. So that's part of what we do. So there's two parts to the audit. And this is the first year that the um, audit was performed under, under consolidation. That started July 1st, 2017 and ended June 30, 2018. So it was the first year of the consolidated numbers. Um, so the, on the first page, it kind of talks about a new standard that was adopted, which is GASB Stable Number 75. That really um, has to do with post-employment benefits that the state of Vermont actually handles for you guys. But that, that number is on there, and that's for um, basically health insurance, et cetera, of, te of retired teachers and what that liability is. Um, there was no other new um, standards implemented during this year. Uh, one thing that we just kind of like to talk about is uh, our accounting estimates that are in the financial statements. Part of those um, is depreciation on uh, the useful life of the assets of which basically buildings and um, equipment. Um, another estimate is also related to GASB 75 and those type of things. Uh, none of that stuff actually hits your fund balance, which is an important number for you guys, not to. Um, on page two, there's a paragraph that kind of talks about uh, difficulties. We had no uh, significant difficulties dealing with, with the management and performing the completion of the audit. Uh, there were um, one uncorrected misstatement that uh, we did not adjust. It was under something that we call materiality. It had to do with um, the prepaid expense and adjusting the HRA liability. Uh, as you probably remember, that was the first year as well as there was the HSA and the HRA part of the health insurance. Um, and they were still, there were some issues with the, with the company that was doing this accounting. Not really accounting, but the, the, yeah, the administration of it. So we know that the liability might not have been exactly right, but we didn't know what it was. But it wasn't, a, we don't believe it was a significant number. Um, we proposed 13 adjustments to the financial statements, which were accepted in recording. Four of these adjustments were material to the financial statements, and I'll talk a little bit about, about that a little bit later. Um, two of those were to adjust checking and savings accounts to correct year imbalances. One was to match up uh, grant revenues with expenditures, and one was to correct the amount of revenue for the rate and tuition. Um, 
the, the ones related to the grant revenues and expenditures and the Raven tuition is something that that we sometimes assist in every year. Uh, the other two, with the checking and the savings account, um, we actually had a finding on those not being done, and, and we'll discuss that, in a, I'll, and I'll read you the finding. I'm not sure if you actually have a copy of it with what you have. Um, we had no, no disagreements with management, and um, again, I'm going to skip this significant deficiency internal control to the end, just to kind of talk about that. Um, a couple other, um, on page three, a couple other recommendations that we had is that all the checkings and savings and investment accounts be titled in orange Southwest School District's name. There are many of them still in all the, the old district's name at June 30, 18. I uh, did talk to Robin last week, and some of these, a lot of them have been transferred, but not all of like, the scholarships and the student activities accounts and et cetera had not quite yet been transferred into OSSD's name, which needs to get done. And that was, uh, I guess, believed was going to happen by the treasurer. It never happened before. So that's something that, that is, I know, on her radar to get finished by the end of this year. Um, I have a question. Sure. But those would retain the purpose uh, uh, noted by a donor if that was a scholarship. So if it was just for a Brookfield student and it was changed, if the name was changed to this mechanism that you're suggesting, those accounts would still represent if a donor had given that money. If that was specifically for just a Brookfield, it yeah, should. Just, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the scholarships were in were in the high school, not in the smaller schools. Those just had like agency funds and you know smaller stuff like that. But most of the big um, scholarship funds and all that are in the high school anyway. So I don't think it was specified, at least in anything that I can remember. And it, I could be wrong. It said like specific students. I'm pretty sure it was already kind of consolidated because it was at the high school level. Okay. But each of the you know each of the student activities accounts, I believe, and I can't remember without looking back at it, that every um, every school had their own student activity account. But I there were there were ones opened up, and some of the money had been transferred over by June 30. 18, but there's been a lot more work done on that, and I'm sure Robin can speak to that. But she, she, did, I did talk to her last week about it just to see how that was coming. Um, but the, really, they shouldn't be in those in the old names because there is no, there's no entity called Great Tree School District anymore. But legally, those are you know they should be done. Um, so speaking of agency and scholarships, funds, uh, hopefully when everything gets changed over, they'll, uh, everything will start being accounted for in, in the accounting system at the business office. Just suggest that, that there's lots of good reasons for that to be done, and, and so there's really some provided, some better controls on all that, that money. And uh, we suggest that the board adopts a fund balance policy, which had, had not been done yet, which kind of clarifies what you can and can't do with um, fund balances, which you kind of, you just have to follow the state statute anyway. Um, Is that not something where you're currently doing? Uh, so back in 2011, there was a new governmental auditing standard that just, that, uh, had you, that the board was supposed to adopt, it would have been at each level, um, who can assign a fund balance, who can commit, it's just really just a for, you know, formality saying we're following these standards and this is what should happen and just hasn't been done for other things I think uh, could have had it so, 2011? Just 2011. So I'm just taking notes so I know what I'm following up Yeah, on. that's fine. Um, so, Discussing the, the finding, and I'm not sure if everyone has a copy of this audit because this is actually the, the compliance audit. And I'm not, I don't, I don't see you guys have, do you have two copies? 
policy and then um, we go to the actual invoice and make sure that it was approved and I mean we don't I don't go and make sure that you have that copier that well not copiers you lease but you know yeah. that you don't have specific new things but your new truck or anything like that but we look at the invoice and um, make sure there was stuff that was approved if there was a you know if, if let's say there was a big addition at the school that might be a process that we might actually go take a walk but <laughs> i'm not a you know 
not a builder, but we would like at least make sure that it was being done, let's say, you know, that there was a, a new addition being done. I can step out too if that if there's other questions that folks have. It's so in review of just to stick with the capital purchases and you know, I wasn't here when these capital purchases were being made, but do you feel like there is a sound of process on the um, business office and the controls on, again, you know, um, placing that order, receiving the equipment, and then the sign-off, that there is not, that's not all under the purview of just one person? That there's like a second set of eyes, you know, to, to confirm, you know, the checks and balances that you would expect in any large business. Do we have that in our business office? Um, I believe so. You guys, the board also has responsibility to when they're looking at the orders. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the business office. It's, okay. it's, it's all of you. Because there's, you know, the, the warrants go out and it's stuff gets reviewed and et cetera. It's good to ask questions too when something. Right, I mean, you guys signed the, I don't have the exact procedures with me right now, and it's been a while since I've got them, but you guys are looking at them. Right, just, we don't, we don't do much oversight of the warrants. Did you look at them? And sign them. And sign, sign them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be a good idea once in a while to ask for questions. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, if you don't ask questions, people think you're not watching. But that is one of the controls that I mean that I rely on. Like, is is the board looking at the you know the warrants that they're signing? But I mean, for what we saw from the purchases that happened during this this year, they were you know I would say that we we looked at the invoices, we saw that the stuff was signed off on. And, but there was a lot. But they also were you know discussed or approved at the at the meetings. That it was going to be done, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think too. Oh, are you new? To be able to. Oh, okay. <laughs> For 1718, she was. Yeah. So oh, okay. Know. Yeah, but it's it's still good. Like as you're looking, yeah. Once in a while, ask for something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to highlight, or think we should know more about? Um, I mean, the biggest, this was a big, big year. There was a lot of work to get done to consolidate everything. And, and um, you know, Robin does an, an excellent job from, from my end. There's a, there's a lot. There was, a, you know, even though it was consolidated, there was a lot to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the state still wants everything separated by school, even though you're consolidated. And so it's not like, oh, it's one smaller, easier, job to do, um, I think, uh, just making sure that that the cash is getting reconciled is really key. And I, I mean, I know you're doing that, but it, it now, um, but that's a big thing that, you know, it's good, yes, there's a separate treasurer, but it's really the responsibility of the business office to make sure that the numbers are right. And if it's not happening, to figure out how to, to get that to happen. So. And, and for folks who are new, we were not unaware of that deficit right along. We've been, no, we not in 17 and 18. No, but it had yet. been reported to, it was reported. It was self-reported in executive right. limitations last right. year. Yeah. yeah, right. It was reported to us. It was when we, yes, we were hoping it was addressed without the measure we had to take. Does anyone else have another question or something they'd like to ask you, sir? You had mentioned accounting for the scholarships in the actual budget. I'm trying to get a little clearer. Not in the budget. Yeah, but, just so I have um, an idea of what we're in looking the account, for. In the accounting system, um, and the state has um, now purchased right, uh, accounting software that I believe if they ever get it up and everybody, running. if they get up and running, that that you're going to have to follow. And my guess is that's going to be, could possibly be a piece of it, although I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But, you know, it's still, it's kind of like one of those things. It's like the, 
the business office and then there's like, well, the school has the scholarship funds, but really it's all under the same, the same entity. And um, taking, you know, there's so many, there's like pages right now of, of bank accounts that have $300 in it, for, you know, people give money. And, you know, it's, it's great, but it's, it's time consuming to keep track of all that. So if there was just a way to even consolidate all that, you know, and if, if you can do that legally. Um, but just having one place where all that stuff is and taking that, like, okay, here is all of the, the agency funds of, of the school district. I just have one more question. Sure. Sorry, but in the um, your, your findings, the summary of your auditor's results, number nine, where it says the school district was determined not to be a low risk oddity. Yes. So I can explain that. Okay. So that has to do with the federal compliance, and because actually this entity is new. Okay. I can't, even though you were in business the last two years as a supervisory union, it's actually a new entity and you can't be a low risk oddity if you, if you um, if have been, historical. If, if you, right, for two years. And now you again won't be a low risk oddity because there was a finding. Right. So that's what that means. And that just means that for the auditor's position, we have to cover more of a percentage of federal dollars. So we have to cover 60% of the federal dollars. If you're a um, not a low risk oddity, that we have to test 60% of those. So it means that basically we have to do a little bit more work to make sure that we're covering. It is like a three year recovery? Two, two years. years. Two. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Sometimes you end up getting that percent because usually we have to pick a big program and the big program almost always covers that, yeah. covers those percentages, right? Because it's like you have to get enough dollars to cover the percent. Mm -hmm. Is it still the case that um, the state is requiring some of the, the funds to go be Sort of linked back to the original the school where they're being used. You mentioned that you know the state needs, still needs Robin to break down some of the funds by where they're being used. Is that still true, or is consolidation now sort of ironed out that? Uh, she needs to report. It's not the funds that are going to each of the schools. She needs to report the expenditures. What the state is doing with it, I'm not really sure. The money the. You know, the, the grant money that comes in is all coming into OSSD, and I don't believe she's reporting separately. The food program probably has more detail by school, just because that's, you know, the numbers. and um, But I don't believe that. I'm not sure if it... It's probably the data collection for the federal government. It's probably a federal government requirement yeah. for the state's reporting. I think the state. I think the state wants to know kind of how much each school's costing oh. is more possibly like okay you have these schools. What are the costs on on each? It's unfortunate that consolidating hasn't sort of eased that process. Well, I, think, I mean, hopefully it will. Mm -hmm. But it's still kind of new. Yeah. Anything else? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And everyone is very helpful. Even though it was hard to reconcile the cash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. you too. Okay, next on our agenda is the second review and approval of the wellness policy. Um, we looked at this last month. This is Healthy Humber Peak Kids. So on the, in the packet, uh, back of the second page in bold D and E under uh, section four, um, there were two inclusions um, during the state audit that they wanted us to make, and they gave us the actual wording that they wanted us to use, so that's what's been included in here. Um, and really it kind of falls around um, making sure that um, if, people are coming in to kind of serve food to the students that are outside the regular lunch program that they're following, the, the smart snacks.
guidelines, um, you know, making sure that they're organic foods, um, that uh, not a lot of process, not a lot of salt, those sorts of things. Um, and then also uh, encouraging folks that aren't uh, normal entities of ours um, that might be providing food to students or, or selling food, um, making sure that they're aware of what those, uh, those smart food guidelines are, smart snack guidelines, and that we're encouraging them to follow them. Um, so people that aren't specifically under our control, but under our auspice. So, so I don't know if there's any questions on. Any further discussion about this wellness policy? Wellness. Okay, we need to um, approve this uh, since this is the second reading. So do I have a motion to approve this wellness so, policy? A second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Right. Any opposed? All right, so the wellness policy is approved. Thank you, we're in compliance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next, um, seeing as we have no public comment, uh, is the review of the EL 2.7 report, um, which is enclosed here. Compensation and benefits, do you wanna talk us through this a little bit? Yeah, so um, executive limitations 2.7, um, kind of in general, it, it seeks to reduce the district's liabilities when it comes to the hiring um, and compensation of non-unionized employees. Um, administrators are a, a perfect um, example of that, um, as well as any kind of outside contractors that we may have uh, come in that we pay under contract. Um, there were only uh, kind of one area of possible concern, and that was enumeration three. Um, and that's the one that restricts benefits and compensation levels to the regional market. And so when I was taking a look through this year, um, there were two things under three that came up. Um, the first was the teacher mentor program. Um, that is something that is not and historically has not been in the master agreement. Um, it typically is in, in most districts. Um, and taking a look at what we're paying both our mentor director and the men mentors themselves, we're about three times what the other districts are paying. Um, only problem with is in correcting this is at this point in time it may be considered past practice. It's something that I'm going to check in um, with Pietro on. Um, I do have a survey that's uh, getting ready to go out to the other superintendents uh, in the, the White River Valley um, group that I'm a part of just to see uh, what their salaries are, you know, what they're paying these folks uh, by a comparison. And if it's not past practice, the idea would be to implement it not next year but the year after to give folks that are currently expecting, um, you know, the, the range of salaries that we now have um, to get those for a year so that they can plan. Um, so that's uh, in process. The other piece um, was a student assistance program counselor. This is our drug and alcohol counselor that serves both uh, the tech center and the high school. Um, he was on a special contract um, when he really should have been a, a district employee under the CBA. Um, there was some reason for that. Does anyone with, who has been here for a while, do you remember? We had, there was some reason for that, and I'm not yeah. sure what it is. I'm not sure what it, what it was either, um, but one of the things that it did um, was that it m kept him from being protected under our liability insurance, and I don't think he was ever required to carry his own. Um, so having him under the new contract that we just put into place for him for next year, um, re remediates that, fix that. Um, it also allowed him to be highly compensated compared to uh, other folks um, of kind of equal experience and stature. Um, also prevented him from gaining kind of the common benefits that the other employees get, so there was kind of a balance there. So he was not able to pay into the retirement system this whole time, um, was not able to take advantage of the other benefits that uh, our, our, our employees get. And then the other thing that it did, which was in violation with one of the executive limitations, was it provided him with a multi-year contract. Um, and so um, now that he's which we we approved. Yeah, we did. That was that, and you have the right to do that. Yeah, yeah, that, was that, that was the reason. It was because he requested multi year. And we wanted to gotcha. retain him. Yeah. Um, I do remember we did have a vote 
yeah, mm -hmm. to make an exception. Yeah. So if he's willing now to take, he was he was excited, um, especially with the the ability. I mean, he's in he's in the municipal insurance, um, but at least he's he's paying into insurance now. I um, mean, he he does have a, a ten year old, mm -hmm. you know. Technically, he could be working for at least another 10 years, so he'll get vested, which is nice um, to be able to provide that for him. So, so that has been corrected. Um, the teacher mentor one has been noted. Um, you know, we're, I'm recognizing that there may be an issue there relative to the executive limitations. It's a matter of doing the hard research um, in the fall. And, Are uh, they on the CBA? They're not in the CBA. Yep. How much of a full-time or non-full-time is that? Uh, they are about, depending upon who it is, three or four times getting paid what's happening. No, I meant as, as a job, how much of a job is it as far as? So they meet uh, weekly, uh, 50 hours, um, with the mentees um, to provide you know, feedback, uh, to, to help them out with anything that they may be encountering, to help them with their teaching. Um, the director is a little bit more extensive than that. She oversees the, the mentors. There were probably, there were quite a few, probably 20, 30 of them There's last year. Um, and so it is a, a pretty expensive, uh, expansive job, excuse me. Um, there was some reason, I was trying to track down why the director was getting paid as much as she was. There was some reason for doing it, but I can't get any clarity on what that was. So there was a good reason for it. Uh, but I'm still seeking out what the, what the rationale was. Um, but those were the, the two pieces in the, the monitoring report. Um, so like I said, uh, one of them is, has been corrected. Um, the other one is noted, may or may not be correctable if it's past practice, um, but it is, it is being researched. Um, and we'll have an answer for you in the early fall. Um, but other than that, everything is uh, in shape the way it should be for the executive uh, limitations monitoring report 2.7, unless there's questions. So as I recall, this is our first reading of this report, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So um, anyone with further questions should see Lane between now and, and the June meeting and also um, review any of the background materials that are available in the OSSD office um, so that we in full conscience can vote to approve this next month. Okay. Quick, uh interjection we did put in for um, a special meeting to overlap with tonight um, because there was a tentative agreement reached with uh, the teachers union um, and this is probably the if the board would make a motion to, to hear that this is probably the place to talk about that under board management government doesn't have to be uh, an executive session then nope. okay do so i have a motion then to um, add a discussion to the agenda about the proposed CBA contract. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a question, I'm sorry. How are we done? The con should I put this underneath um, oh. okay. 2.7 or is this? Uh, it's, it would be under the category of board governance, board governance? which is so along with. Uh, yeah. So after, uh, I think it was what six or seven hours in mediation. It was a uh, it was a, a long time. A um, lot of discussion back and forth with the mediator. Um, the tentative agreement was a salary increase of three point one five percent of new money. Um, that is. Uh, a step increase as well as a little bit extra so that they get 3.15% overall. Um, and then they had a wording uh, change, something that they wanted added to the contract. And that was uh, that there would be a maximum of three after school meetings per month. Um, which is, is reasonable. Uh, most of the contracts I've seen, that's what's in them if it's stated in a contract. Um, with the exception, unless there's an emergency. If there's an emergency and they need to be in, then they can be called in. Um, so, so those were the two major pieces. The, we also removed a, a section or two of language um, that was from the days when you know there were separate boards, so the language didn't have any relevance or any meaning within the contract anymore. And so those are part of the packet that you have. So th these meetings are, are faculty meetings, they're not student meetings? No. no. So after school meetings, usually department meetings or faculty meetings. Um, 
So. So can you define for me what you consider a regular day? In it terms of the hours. It's not defined. That's that's it's not defined. So I guess then my question would be, what's the expectation of teachers? I mean, the school starts at 7:55 and gets done at 2:25. No. So what are the teachers' expectations for their day at school? So that is stated in their actual faculty handbooks. Um, in most cases, they are required to be there 10 to 15 minutes early, stay 10 to 15 minutes after the regular period of time that the kids are, are, are in the building. Um, but it's stated in the faculty handbooks, and it, it ra rises to the level of being past practice at this point in time. Um, and the expectation is to prepare for class. So any, if they need to do uh, some kind of programming to get prepared for the next day, they're supposed to do yeah, we have, uh, I think the, the strategy and the board can probably talk a little bit more about this was to keep the contract as, as thin as possible, um, just to allow more flexibility for administration and working with the staff. So it's like Lane could define what, what the day is. I'm just often surprised dropping off in the morning and picking up in the afternoon that when I see teachers coming and going. It is, uh, it is possible um, because the next round of negotiations will be starting in about six months, um, right? Because this is just a one-year contract uh, due to the negotiations going on between the state and the, and the teachers union at the state level over health insurance um, to be able to have that discussion. Um, I think, and Paul and I had spoken a little bit, is, um, you know, it might be good to get a, a subcommittee together ahead of time, maybe right at the, in the fall, at the start of the school year, just to sit down and kind of talk about the needs. Um, because one of the things that the, the contract negotiations allow us to do um, is to try to find things of value, add things of value in terms of us being able to achieve the ends that the board has set. Um, and so I think that, that strategizing might be a good thing. Um, Pietro will tell you in terms of you know, having a set day, it does reduce uh, flexibility, but there are benefits to it as well. So it definitely might be worth something to talk about. So three um, after school meetings a month is reasonable from an uh, administrative standpoint? Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, in the, in the, the contracts I've experienced, um, that wording is typically in there, and that's usually what it is. And again, if there are emergencies, um, I think that's kind of the standard um, at the high school. I think the elementary school does more. And I think that's one of the reasons that you know, it came up as part of the negotiations. With the teacher's primary worry of making sure that they have the ability to plan and, and, and do what they need to do to be prepared for the kids. <clears throat> Meeting the elementary teachers, there was a little pushback about meeting after school? Uh, I think because they've had a lot of meetings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just another word about the subcommittee. Um, it would be beneficial for us to have a, a subcommittee or a, a committee to, to talk about it, but also with the teachers. Because the teachers are, are likely to ask for a significant increase um, this coming negotiation. We, we, we basically told them this year, it's only a one-year contract, budget set, we're not going to be doing any huge increase. And they're um, wanting a large increase. And so in the negotiation, I mentioned, if this is something you truly think that you need, a large increase, for example, then we need to discuss that. And it can't be after the budget has been set. It needs to be prior to the budget. So. When we have these subcommittee meetings, we may have to have a subcommittee meeting with members of us meeting with members of the faculty and, and trying to discuss what is a reasonable percentage increase because if we don't discuss it beforehand, it's just going to be what Lane thinks is reasonable um, and we fit into the budget and then it's either going to be right or wrong. We'll either be at budget or we'll break the budget. So we got to be thinking about that. And there, there's a, a good potential for all of this. We do talk about um, all the data that's related to the ends in the fall. And like I said, one of the things 
that um, we should do is craft the strategy around what we're seeking from the teachers, around you know what it, what our drivers are in terms of the ends. Oh, you know we've got we've got these ends. These are the interpretations that go along with them. Um, these are weaknesses right now. Is there something that we can do in terms of the contract to help us reach those goals? Um, for me, the big big thing, you know, we kind of almost. I thought they were almost, um, almost going to be there, but the, the biggest thing for me is the, is the, the number of days off. Um, they have 26 days, um, and they have another eight days on top of it that they can request either personal or emergency. Well, they've got 26 days, and the average number of days our teachers are sick is 20 days. And so if you add that up, it's a significant amount of time lost in front of, of students. Um, and so, you know, that's... Uh, that's a, a, a pretty good piece in terms of the ends, if we can get them in front of the students more frequently, um, the performance will rise uh, across the board. And we saw that, I think we, we looked at the, the, the charts together uh, earlier this year, the schools that had the highest average um, absentee rate were the lowest performing and vice versa. So, but things worth, worth talking about. <laughs> They already approved this contract. To my knowledge, they have not had their meeting yet. Um, so it's a tentative, tentative agreement. Um, the parties that were at the mediation have signed off on it. Um, but again, it would need to be approved by both the board and the, the union before it's, it's ratified. Any other questions and discussion about this proposed agreement? Ready for the vote? We have a motion to approve the um, memorandum, memorandum of agreement with the teachers union. I'll make the motion to accept the memorandum of agreement. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Ready for the vote? All those um, voting. Uh, in approval of this memorandum of agreement with the teacher union, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, we have a legislative uh, update next, Lane. Oh, a lot of stuff. Um, actually, I had to take, take a lot of notes on it because there's a lot of numbers in there. House Ways and Means Committee is proposing to take $7.6 million from the Education Fund to pay for Lake Champlain cleanup. Um, some of this money, uh, they're intending on replacing it with a new tax on software and veterinary supplies, uh, but it would still leave a shortfall of about $600,000, um, which would be paid for uh, using property and income tax yield adjustments. So it would have an impact on our, uh, on our school uh, taxes. Um, the state realized an unexpected $4 million loss uh, due to an increase in the number of students being outplaced. So we've talked uh, a lot about you know, the number of students of trauma that we have um, and, and, and the cost of, of working with the students in the case that a lot of them need to be sent out to, to residential um, placement. Um, the state's also feeling that as well. Um, so they're discussing a new tax on candy, clothing, and software downloads to pay for that, that $4 million shortfall. Um, the proposed, they're making some proposed changes to Act 173. Act 173 is the special education um, funding bill um, that takes us away from a reimbursement model to a block uh, grant funded model. Um, they're looking to add another year um, for implementation, so it pushes us about two more years out, um, which would be good. Um, Senate Bill 40, um, which is the lead bill, it has moved forward. Um, they are currently seeking a five parts per billion threshold um, in terms of lead in drinking water, and they want every fix fixture in every school that could be used um, for drinking water to be tested. Um, they want the testing to be completed by December 31st of 2020. Uh, Vermont Department of Health will pay for all fixtures needing to be replaced um, up to specific limits, which when I looked at them, they seemed you know, fairly reasonable. Um, but the problem is if it's something outside of the fixture, or if it's above those costs, the schools um, 
will be paying for them. Um, the state has promised to cover the first round of, of actual testing in this new round of discussions on, on this bill. And then uh, everything beyond that will be on the schools. Um, Uh, they set up uh, or are working to set up a committee uh, to examine school compliance with uh, the privacy of student records um, as it relates to FERPA. And really what they're looking for is the committee to kind of go out in the new modern data age um, to make sure that people have proper firewalls and protections in place and we'll make recommendations back to the legislature. Um, H79, House Bill 79, um, is a farm to school bill and it's going, seeking to require 20% of food and lunch programs to be local um, and then to investigate ways to try to ensure that uh, all the students that are eligible for free and reduced run lunch are enrolled. Um, that's been a, a problem around here. We've got a lot of students that uh, the parents just haven't enrolled despite um, how much we reach out and how much arm twisting that we do. Um, Senate Bill 86 uh, has actually been passed by both the House and the Senate, and this is the one that raises the age for tobacco and uh, tobacco-rated paraphernalia to 21. So just waiting for the governor's signature on that, and he has said he will sign it. So. Is that effective this year? So, unless there's questions. It seems like they're taking a long time. I don't know if this is... Yeah, they are. Yeah, usually when they get wrapped up, but... I mean, the only other one that really doesn't affect us was they're still kind of battling it out over um, delaying the forced consolidation of some districts. Um, so much so to the point where one of the committees that was studying it is asked to be dissolved uh, and reformed just because they, they've hit such an impasse on it. So. Next is the consent agenda, um, which we'll approve as a slate. So we have the minutes uh, from our uh, April meeting, which are enclosed here. To review, we've got um, to approve ministry of staff contracts. They're in here. Those are in here. Yep. So those are things that I will sign. Mm -hmm. um, professional staff contract, uh, new hires as well. And then uh, unanticipated revenue. So this was a discussion with the auditors. Um, above and beyond even what we anticipated in, in terms of tuition revenue from school choice students, because um, we had anticipated a bit, we actually earned another 200000 above. Um, so it's my responsibility to make sure that I inform the board. Why such a windfall? More kids than we expected uh, mm -hmm. that, that came than, than we predicted. It's funny, we're already looking at the numbers. Um, for next year, but, but of course, there's still a lot of transition that'll happen between now and the, and the end of the summer. Um, the way things look right now is that Randolph is steady state, the high school and the uh, elementary, um, but it looks like uh, we've got about 10, 10 to 12 extra students coming into Braintree and 10 to 12 extra students coming in here. Um, so Braintree might, might even be over 100 next year. This should be uh, over 80. Wow. Um, wow. So the that's numbers good. numbers are increasing, and that's not including the preschools. So the preschool students are completely in addition to that. That's great. So are those people, those are people who are out of the area who are at out. the high school level that are coming here. But what about here in Brookfield, or is that just people moved in? Just people it? moving in. Okay. So school choice is is funny. Um, it's really nine nine to twelfth grade. Okay. It's really kind of high school, unless um, the unusual circumstance happens that a, a district does not have a school of a lower grade level. Say they eliminated their elementary schools, then they're responsible to to uh, school choice those students out as well, uh, so they get their education. So do I have a Motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second? Second. Who was All the those move? in favor? Who was uh, the first? Anne. 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 Okay. And Ashley. All yeah. those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Reports and incidentals. Um, we'll start with the superintendent's report. Uh, so we talked. I talked a little bit in there about um, working what, I, what I'm calling the API process in the fall. Um, 
with the faculty. Um, the last year and a half or so has kind of been spent um, just resolving um, kind of a number of ongoing HR issues, um, some of which were kind of impeding the process uh, towards the ends, and as well as kind of working with the budget to put some structures in place um, so that we can focus a little bit more, more strongly on academics. Um, so the API cycle is a yearly cycle. Uh, the first thing that you do is you analyze the data, right? One of the things that we've been working on with the faculty, um, especially the math department and the special, special educators this year, um, is interpreting the board's ends, right? They're putting their own interpretation on it. They've looked at mine. Um, they are determining what assessment methods that they will use to measure their progress towards that. So they will be the ones that are collecting that data and reporting it to me so that I can report it to you um, to get them heavily involved in terms of their own progress and how the students are doing. Um, after the analysis is the planning phase, they identify what their needs are, what their weaknesses are. Um, they start to talk about what they need to get into place to address those weaknesses. And that's an important process because it should be informing the budget. Right? what their needs are, right? We should be reaching down um, bottom up instead of top down in terms of what, what, what our budget is and what our budget is serving. Um, and then after that, it's implementation, right? You've analyzed things, you've got a pretty good handle on it, what it is uh, that you need. Um, you've taken a, a strong look at what you think is reasonable, reasonably gonna affect the change that you're looking for based on those needs, and then you get it into place. And every year follows that same cycle. Um, what good, high-performing, solid districts do um, that other districts do not um, is they will pick two or three things that work really well and they will just hammer away at them year after year until they get every maximum benefit they can um, before they move on to uh, another initiative. Um, and so this is really trying to bring the focus down to the faculty level um, on the board's ends, uh, what it means to be successful on them, and get the faculty engaged in kind of using those ends and, and those assessments to examine their own practice and improve it. Um, the other two pieces that were in the report that we spoke about a little bit um, was Brookfield made the final decisions on uh, the preschool program and what the structure would be. Um, we had some data that came back in the survey um, that made us a little bit unsure about the child care needs. Um, Brookfield really, really wanted the after school program, really wanted the public preschool, but child care was in question. Um, so we had a, a meeting up here, we talked with some folks, um, had a couple of emails that went back and forth that were, were, were pretty good. Um, and so we have decided uh, that we will have the child care um, next year. So from 7.30 to 12.30 um, will be child care for three to four year olds. Um, those children then can move into the, the public preschool from 12.30 to 2.30, uh, four days a week. And then in the afternoon from 2.30 to 5.30, there's a K to six after school program um, for all students. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it uh, when we get to the financials, um, but there was about $55,000 um, generated from the child care and after school program at Braintree alone. Um, didn't quite put us in the black for that program, got us close, but I think that number is impressive because it really kind of spells out the need that's out there in the communities. Um, if, if a community at a small school of less than 100 kids is paying 55000 a year for child care and uh, after school care, um, there, there's definitely a need for it. So that, sorry to interrupt you. So that means that the th age three and four kids don't get the after school care. They will have to go home on the bus or something? That's the, that's the quirky part about all this um, is uh, K to six, right? Uh, kindergartners usually are, are age five, right? Mm -hmm. um, there is a whole other set of laws and licensures that would go along with an after school program for the, uh, the ages three and four. It's something we could put into place in future if there is a need, uh, but we've got to see what, what the need is going to be. Um, because it's a whole other program, whole other staff. Um, it's actually called extended preschool. Um, so it's not an after school program. And the way that the state regulates it is that the needs for those in instructors because the kids are younger is pretty extensive. Um, so is, is this the same model that's currently happening at Braintree? Pretty close to, except they're a year ahead of us. So they will also have the, that extended preschool as well. Oh, so, and this year, do they have extended preschool? Uh, they built it in towards after the year started. 
Oh, so they do have it. Then. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be a problem for Brook, like some of the Brookfield parents that were here at that yeah. meeting? Is that, that they needed to after school care for their, yeah. you know, their kids of all different ages? Uh, based on the discussions and the survey data, uh, we, we went with the, the highest three. Like I said, even the child care piece was a bit iffy, um, and the extended preschool piece was even, even lower. Um, so we did focus on the highest three. But the other thing, too, um, is once the programs are up and running, if it really starts to fill up, if there's a need, Right? And we've got these programs full, uh, full and, and the ones that are, that are for payer generating a little bit of revenue, we can always go back, uh, revisit, and bring it in you know, uh, in late fall or in the winter. The other thing that came out up at that meeting was the difficulty of recruiting um, after-school caregivers yeah. for something like this, after um, the early morning for the 730. I don't want to hex it I'm gonna, uh, by, by saying we've been having good luck with hiring. Oh, good. I don't want to say too much because I'm afraid it'll curse things. Uh, but we've been having really good luck with hiring so far. Um, I think the consolidation has something to do with it. Consolidations across the state. I think there's more people that are available uh, from schools that have closed down, um, which is one of the reasons why. So keeping our fingers crossed. I have a couple questions about, um, earlier you talked about the, it's a teacher's um, developing their own assessments for I guess how the how the students are coming along, which is really assessing themselves in a way, right? Yeah. Um, is that is it typical for? I mean, is that a normal process for the teachers to assess themselves? Yeah. And do we worry about um, the the bias that is that is present when someone assesses their own? So the the assessments. Right, another way. The assessments, the, the, one of the requirements on it, right, is they, they are doing the interpretation, um, of course, with our oversight and with our guidance. Um, the requirement on the assessments is that they have to be objective. It's not based on the grades that you're giving the students in the class. Um, you know, SBAC, one of the reasons that I settled on it that the, the first year, um, of course, you weren't, weren't here in, um, in the fall, was because it was objective, right? You could, you could look at it. It, it. it is what it was. There was no perception in there to kind of shift it at all. Um, and so what they're looking at right now um, is they've got Track My Progress that runs up uh, through eighth grade. Um, they're looking at what they call the STARS program, which is another outside program that's tied to the Common Core um, that they can do, you know, 15, 20 minute assessments here and there can give them kind of immediate feedback on, on where the students are at. Um, and they can also use it for longer term assessments. Um, one of the things that I've noticed um, and has kind of come out of the discussions uh, with the faculty um, is the students are actually doing quite a bit of learning in class. Problem isn't what they learn. They know it right then and there. The problem um, in some of these cases is retention. For whatever reason, right, they learned it in front of the teacher here today. They're able to use it for a few days, um, but there's no spiral back in the curriculum to make them rethink about it and, and, and use it again a little bit later down, so the retention's poor. So I think a lot of the, the scores uh, that I've seen, especially in mathematics, there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of the contributing factors is, is that lack of retention. One of the nice things about these assessment systems, and it's one of the reasons we had midterms and, and cumulative um, finals when we were in school, was it makes you go back, rethink your way through most of what you learned, or at least the most important of what you learned, um, because it increases retention. If you can think about things three to seven times, it's going to be with you for life. Um, and so that's part of it as well. Um, but no, it's uh, ob objective assessments. So when you report the ends, it won't be the teachers no. kind of no. there are of their, of their performance. No, no, and, and I've got a, I've, I've, I've got a, I've got a pretty good handle. But in terms of talking about the professional learning communities, the, the types of, of, of groups that should be active in schools, that's what they do. Um, a high-performing professional learning community in a school is usually a department or it's a grade-level team that sits down and it looks at the data. And it says, okay, based on this, all our students were poor on, on, on these two or three standards. What are we going to do to go back right here and now to teach it in a different way so that they get it and to know that they got it? Um, or um, 
after you've dealt with any kind of curricular issues, it's okay, you know, when we're taking a look at these assessments, these, these three students are really struggling. So these guys are going to get, we know they need some extra help, so we're going to put them in, in one of our, and they've got a whole bunch of them, um, different support programs there so that the students can go in for, you know, an hour here, hour there, um, and get caught up on the pieces that they're missing so they're not getting left behind. Um, but that's the work that the department should be engaged in. So I just have a clarifying question on that. Yeah. Um, like that analysis of that information, and we talk about each of those departments. So I'm assuming, and I should probably know the answer, there um, is a department chair for each of your major departments, English, science. High math. school level, there are, school. Lead, there are lead teachers at the elementary. Um, elementary structured a little differently. They usually go by grades as opposed to discipline. So just with our eye on the high school for a moment, because I'm thinking about the um, <laughs> the testing results that we are well aware of. Is there that lead, let's say, for instance, the math department, um, that department chair is meeting with all of the other math teachers, and that it, uh, curriculum is being defined at that level on how that trickles down or trickles up through the system. Yeah. And then that analysis is being done in that setting as well as that individual. Yeah, so they had their they had their very first K to twelve meeting about a month ago in the math department, um, which was good. So we had the uh, a collective group of the elementary teachers, not all of them, uh, but a collective group because they all teach teach a little bit of math. Um, in talking with the math department, and what they were really focused on was that interpretation of the ends, and it was kind of it was impressive. They didn't they didn't come up with a, a final interpretation. Um, because they were so aggressive, and, and I mean this in a positive way, about all the things that they wanted the kids to be able to know and do. Um, so it was very impressive. Um, so the meeting that's happening on the 28th is trying to weed that down into a final statement. They've already kind of settled in um, on the assessment tools uh, that they want to use, um, which is good, but they're really honing in on, on that, that interpretation piece. Um, so as far as the board is concerned, um, putting those ends out the way that you did was a really good thing. Um, the piece that has to happen is it's got to be the teachers that are working with it. We look at it, we examine it, um, we hold them accountable by saying, hey, you're weak here, we're going to provide you resources, what resources do you need? Um, but it's, it's really them that has to, has to own it and look at it. And um, it's kind of funny, we, we've talked about retention in another way earlier this year, which is you know, how many teachers are we keeping each year. Um, one of the things that retains teachers is high-performing PLCs, those professional learning communities, um, because it's, it's in interacting with their peers uh, that they get the most learning and growth, um, and that, that, that is valuable. That's usually the thing that keeps them around for a long time. So going back to the, to the defined day and only three meetings a month, how are they fitting that in their schedule? Because I built it in, I built okay. in half days every 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 okay, month. So that that was, was remember I was talking about we were spent a year kind of building the structures before we could do the work. That was part of it. Okay. Um, the elementary principals are awesome, but they're very very aggressive about using that time. So they kind of they kind of fill it up every time they get it. I'm trying to pull some of that time back to be able to do this work for them. Um, I'll be the, the primary person um, doing the work next year with them, but I've also I've got the K to 12 uh, English person, so I got kind of a K to 12 English uh, director, and I'll have a K to 12 math director as well um, to support this work as well as Katie at the high school. So while we don't have a so curriculum director, I've got parts English, and pieces that kind of English and English and math right now. And math. Yeah. They will all be working on the interpretation and developing their ends, um, but English and math are fundamental to all the others right, right. so if we get those up and running um, get the, the other scores to start to rise that the, the larger community and the state sees um, from us will be in very good stead um, it all kind of plays into a, a goal of keeping the enrollments increasing as long as we've got more students coming in we can continue to build programs the more programs we build the, the more students that we will get um, we're kind of at the point where we've mopped up all the students that are around just because of consolidations and closures. Um, we've got uh, students, um, I was actually pretty impressed with the students that, that, that we've got coming uh, next year under school choice, um, but there's only so many students that fall into that category that we can grab. We're now at the point where we've just got to build better schools if we want to keep keep those enrollments going up by having people physically moving down to go. Right, well, we need to 
we've got employment opportunities at the hospital yep. <laughs> at, at various locations around the area but people it, aren't wanting to locate here so it will, that will all sort of snowball it will all grow together um, and that's that's the the piece that we're looking at you know preschool yeah 99% nine, of preschool is because we need it it's good for the kids 1% is because if we've got them people will move into town to take advantage of them um, so there's a there is a bigger bigger picture here that that 200,000 that we just talked about the reason that I was making sure that you knew about it is because it allows me to spend a little bit of it before we have to claim it for reserves um, we've got the you know, a lot of talk has happened the last year or two over, you know, the kids don't have any computer science courses, they don't have coding, they do next year. Um, they'll have, they should have a robotics, uh, very well-developed robotics program. Um, they will have their coding, uh, and hopefully we're gonna try to be able to big, build the Lego robotics down into the, the elementary schools to kind of support that as well as part of the STEM initiative. So a lot, a lot going on. So Lee, just one clarifying question. You mentioned the English director and the math director. Are those two new positions that you're hiring, or are those positions consolidations under the under the budget? So the K to 12 um, English is here. She's under the regular budget. Um, she was part time under. Uh, title we were able to move her out with the the budget increase okay. and get her so that she's regular um, the only two people that were left in title um, when we were looking at that budget increase is because we didn't want to go for the 18 percent um, was uh, the math person there was some restructuring that was happening there anyway um, so the math person will come out of the out of title and then we had like a 50 percent um, special education um, support sort of person that was in there as well but that's it um, everybody else has been moved out of title into the regular budget, um, which we couldn't depend on the money. I mean, you know, this year we couldn't even get the services to the kids that that money was geared for until November. Um, and then next year, um, it may be problematic. The, the AOE is working really hard, but they're still not got their systems as quite up and running the way they need to be. But they're working on it. I give them a lot of credit. Thank you. <clears throat> How close are we to that line where? Uh, uh, we were like 18%. Oh, 1,000 bucks per student. So we still got 1,000 bucks per student. Um, what was interesting was um, Bruce Labs, uh, they're pretty close to it. I mean, they're, they're over 18,000. And I think if I remember, I have to go back and look, so don't quote me, but I think we're at 17.3, and I think the line is 18.3. So we're 17,147 or something like that per student. So I think, think uh, White River was, was right around 18, could or take a little bit. So, so there's some leeway. And again, the more students we have, the, the right. farther we get. Yeah. More money. Um, the last piece was uh, went and you know, made sure to talk with the uh, elementary uh, principals and just making sure that people do realize uh, that therapeutic program is open to all three elementaries. So I'll repeat that a few times. Um, it is based on priority. What they were looking at is they were as they were getting the program set up, they were kind of discussing well, what's the easiest way? Do we want to you know have students come from another school um, before we're sure the program's up and running um, fully? But no, it's it's based on priority. Um, so as they go through the any of the students that are on an, an education plan, as they go through the meetings, the, the yearly um, meetings at the end of the year to kind of evaluate how the students are doing, they are creating a priority list. Um, these are the students are the best fits for the program right now. These are a little bit farther down the line, but should be worked in when the time comes, and they will be taken in priority order. How many students will the program be able to fit in? All depends on the severity of the students. Um, we actually have made uh, two really good hires, exceptionally talented people, um, expensive people, but exceptionally talented, um, who have worked with uh, these students who have worked with Dave Melnick's strategies uh, before and who actually have worked together before. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've got a, a good fit going in. But it's, uh, you know, that, that's one of the, I'm going to tie it in with, with special education. You know, one of the questions I was trying to get at is, how big of a caseload should a special educator have? Well, it depends on how tough the kids are that you're working with. Um, six kids may be a hefty workload, um, depending upon what their needs are. 20 kids may be appropriate, again, depending on their needs. So it'll, I can't give you a straight answer. It'll depend on the needs. Um, but as many, many as can be, can, can be, be, be cycled through. Um, and doing, you know, just the, the general math of it, um, again, the caring for the kids is the primary piece. 
But, you know, if we can prevent even just three kids in the next couple of years from having to go to outplacement, we paid for the program. So have we done some kind of assessment of all of our students to figure out who might be in there? They do them every year. So, right, every so if we do it every year, what, where are we for the needs then? So because you said it could be 20, it could be 6. So if we've already assessed them. Well, they're, they're going through the year and assessments now. That's what okay. I mean by every year they, they do that, and they're making that list. Oh, all right. Um, the other piece is that uh, uh, they're talking with Natalie and Deb um, is that they've got to figure out if I've got a spectrum this big, where does the program fit? Mm -hmm. They're going to be hopefully rare, but there will be some students that we just can't accommodate here. Who are they? Um, down on this end, these are students that should be getting uh, the resources and support they need through best practice in the classroom. Are they getting that? So part of their discussion is, you know, where is their range for this program fit? Mm -hmm. We know it's up in the moderate to, to severe range, but you know, how severe can we go? Good, you make it. I hadn't thought about this stuff in a couple of days. I'm glad you're making me think about it again. Other questions? Other? Um, so beyond your report, um, we've got RTCC. Is there anything you should know? I know that they had their... Good news, we had people there. Good. We had a... Uh, and a board member from yeah, we had a board White River. Member from White River, yeah. <laughs> so they just, White River just consolidated. You all are all familiar, and uh, this was the first meeting the board member showed up. So we had a board member there, and we didn't have the usual board member from uh, Northfield, uh, Williamstown. Right, since their consolidation, I don't think they've seen it. It's been a while. Yeah, and so... Um, so you just had one? Mm -hmm. So well, we, we, we had the one board member, and then we had the uh, woman from uh, uh, CCV, CCC, okay. CCV, which was good. Then, I don't know who the gentleman was. He was funny. I, f I found him afterwards when I was going through the open house just to invite him in to come talk with me if you wanted I, to. I think he's a parent. He's a community right? member. He's a community member from Brookfield, right? Yeah. 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 But, but um, neat guy. So he was a community member there. And, and, and so did you talk about moving the RTCC meetings to be? Yep. And um, they so were in the whole. Just a second. Did we propose perhaps moving the RTCC meetings because we have had such a hard time getting board members to, to come? Um, or participate to having them begin at six, uh, four times a year, or three times a year before this meeting. So we would obviously have a quorum of, of ourselves, and hopefully, and we would invite uh, board members um, from the other districts. But we would, you know, have a more robust discussion um, with. With Jason, who currently right. is the director of RTCC. Anyway, so yeah, so currently it's just usually the meeting is Jason and then one of our board members. Yeah. And so it's kind of rough to have any kind of discussion. Yeah. It's not really a discussion. It's more of here's my report. Okay, here's my couple questions, and then it just ends. And so it'd be 30 minutes would be plenty of time. Um, but. Um, yeah, they, they were okay with it. They didn't have a day that did not work. Second Monday of each month worked for the board member uh, that was there. He said that their board meetings are the third Monday, he thought, but he wasn't sure because he was no longer on the uh, oh. <laughs> main board. He's only on this board, so um, something like that. There's something weird like that, so yeah. he will be able to make it on Mondays. And then CCV, um, she said she could make it, and... Um, so Jason was amenable. Right. Okay. And then we just got to reach out to Leo, uh, Connolly, and um, whoever the representative is from Northfield. Um, I don't know. What, what are they called now, now that they're consolidated? Northfield, Will, Williams, I'm not sure. Um, We're getting a lot of the Payne, Northfield Payne teachers. Payne Hill. Payne, right. Payne Mountain. Payne yeah. Mountain. Payne Mountain. Is that what they're called? P-A-I-N-E, -E. yeah. So we got to reach out to Payne Mountain and figure out if they're able to make it. In. What's what's neat about um, the decision to possibly hold it as a part of, part of this board is that I think within our own community, um, I don't think they hear a lot about the tech center no. that exists right here, and so I think there are a lot of a lot of folks that do, um, you know, watch watch the cable. There are folks that show up here. I think it'll just get the word out about all the great things that are happening there, and that hey, this actually exists. There's 147 kids here um, that we serve. So I think I think that'll be a good thing. Is that something that we can begin um, in September or August, whenever the next? Yeah. The um, in the kind of the reading of of the. 
what the regs are um, is they they do have to have an advisory presence um, so you know invite the advisors in you, as the board that actually makes the decision it is this board right. um, but uh, they have to have an advisory presence they have to have input on any kind of policy changes um, so much so that if they give you their advice and you decide not to take it I have to file a report with the secretary not just I mean they won't check but just to say hey we went against the advisory board's advice um, so there, there is a little bit of teeth to that um, which is interesting. So yeah. Yep. Good. So that will be scheduled for either August or September. Yeah. This. Well, great. And I saw that we did not have a report from the high school this time. He was sick for he, several days. I don't know if he. Well, it won't stand camera, but he yeah. was very sick. Okay. Uh, maybe for a, for a while. We can talk about that in a second. Okay. Yeah. Um, and. Were there any questions or comments about the elementary principal's report? I didn't notice any further comments about um, distribution of administrative services over the three elementary schools. No, I'm actually, I'm coming in. We've got the, the superintendent's conference at Lake Maury the end of this week. Um, but I told them I'd be coming in and, and spending a lot of time in this building um, in May. So over the after this week, probably the next two weeks, I'll be spending a lot of time here just to see how it's going. Um, David's been spending a lot of time up here, which I think is wonderful. Yep. Any other questions or comments from any other board member? Okay, we also have the financials. So talk, talk with Robin. Um, everything is as it should be, which is always good. I took a look at some things myself. Um, everything's on track with where it was last year, um, perhaps a little bit better. We will end in the black. Um, I can talk a little bit about surpluses. Um, in terms of uh, the tech center, um, they're looking at about a $60,000 surplus at this point in time. Um, in terms of Raven, they are looking at a $65,000 surplus, which we, they will use to apply towards the, the, the transition that, that's currently underway. So do we know why those? Kids? Um, in, in some cases, uh, it's kids. In some cases, remember that we are planning the budget a year in advance based upon current right. staff. Right. And so whenever you get the transitions in staff, if we hire a little lower. Um, let's see. The, as far as OSSD is concerned, um, we actually did, did pretty well this year uh, in terms of surplus. So if you just look at the budget, uh, from, la from the, the current year that we're in, there will be $57,000 left over. So that's actually pretty good considering it was a $17 million budget. Um, we are also receiving another $131,000 in reimbursements uh, for special education from state place students, right? We pay for them up front. At the end of the year, the state pays us back for it. And then we have the 200000 in unanticipated tuition revenue that we just talked about. So if at uh, the OSSD, we're talking about $388,000 um, in terms of surplus. So, yep, there will be some to, to put towards the, the new roof on uh, Randolph Elementary in terms of the, re the reserves at the end of the year. Does anyone have any other questions about the financial report that was presented? Okay, next is the facilities uh, reports. So there's a, we t had talked uh, last time um, about you know the need to have eyes on the target in terms of things that have been purchased. So I put in kind of a restructure of the facilities report, hopefully to, to serve that. Um, you'll see that in the, in the packet there. There's a couple pages of instructions that have gone to uh, the facilities managers. Uh, we sat down with Robin, um, had a little bit of discussion with the auditors actually, um, to kind of come up with this idea of a threshold. What is a reasonable threshold um, that above which that somebody should have eyes on the ground, that somebody should actually go out and make sure the work is done or make sure that if it was a uh, uh, piece of equipment that was purchased that it's actually here and the threshold was 5,000. Um, so what you're going to see in this report 
um, is, a, is a couple of things. It's got a, a few more details. It's very similar to what you've seen before, uh, but the biggest thing is that it's going to go into Google, Google Docs um, about every week, every other week. Um, we will go through the report, the things that they are putting on there, um, which is everything that they purchase above $5,000, um, and they will take either myself or Robin on a tour. Um, when we have seen it, we go into Google, Google Docs. We have access to the column where we can put in our initials, and we will initial it. It's, it's been, been checked in time. Um, and so that's, uh, that's all set up, and that's, that's happening right now. Um, I think what the other piece was. Oh, the uh, other part of this is the estimates. Um, so they have to provide an estimate for this for this work, um, or if they're purchasing it, you know, have to have to show what the cost is going to be. Um, at any time that the board would like to see those estimates, they are providing detailed copies with, for me. Um, so if there are things that you have questions about, especially if it's something that you know I'm asking for. Re uh, reserve funds for, um, I can provide you the full details ahead of time uh, in terms of this. And that way we know that you know what they're asking for, what I'm asking for, is actually tied to what the need is. Uh, so I think that should be helpful. And current, so the current uh, expectations that they'll present the estimate to you or Robin, and so then... It doesn't doesn't go on this list until until that, uh, that estimate okay. is in. And then yeah. when the work is finally done, whether we review it, someone else is going to review yeah. how close, you know, whether this was in the ballpark. Yeah. And then the, the two columns that are in there, there's the actual... There's the estimate column. There's the uh, the actual cost column, right? What you actually pay afterwards. Um, there and there, they, they keep totals. Um, and one of the reasons to do that, it's it's able to review. Hey, you know, this year, you know, you had you know million dollars in estimates, but for some reason, actual cost was 1.5. What's going on? Um, it provides a little bit more data to be able to ask those sorts of questions, as well as to be able to say, hey, look, every time you use this vendor, they're always 50% over estimate. So it's it's providing some 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 data that, that's usable um, as, as part of the intent to how that's structured. Good. Um, so. Any other questions or comment? All right, we've got the board evaluation. Uh, um, I would say the only thing um, we should work on is uh, just more participation from everybody. A couple of us spoke a little bit more than others, and that's it. Otherwise, I, think, I mean, I don't think anybody was tampered and said, do not talk, or anything like this. I think we just, if we could, try to have more um, involvement. See me on Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, um, I think it's fine. Okay, um, so next we have an executive session. So.